Uh, we had a couple of questions about a woman's role in the church. It's kind of like, what do you think? What should we do? And it's just like, you know, I don't, I didn't make the rules. Let's let's turn to see what actually, you know, the person who made the rules say. And and that's what we're going to turn to. We're going to look at the scriptures. Welcome back. Welcome back, everyone. Thank you for joining us on Are You Sure? The podcast. I am D, the troublemaker here with my cousin, Elder Sykes, the wise guy. And we are having a wonderful time, as always. Um, if you joined this last episode, you know, we just celebrated the 40th episode and we're moving Amen. into the next section. Amen. We want to take a moment to say thank you for uh, supporting the channel. Thank you for viewing, liking, sharing, whatever you do to contribute even if you're just, you know, passing along and you say, hey, I know a podcast and they tune in. Uh, we appreciate it all. Um, we hope that you are truly being inspired because that's the goal of this podcast to inspire Bible believers to become Bible students. Um, you know, our focus is to help grow God's kingdom by um, helping people find their way through the scriptures and to the truth. Um, with that being said, last episode, we um we discussed hell and a lot of misconceptions over the last few episodes. We yeah. talked about a lot of controversial, so-called controversial uh, topics, but we really looked at it from a biblical perspective and we just took the scripture for what it says. One of the things we talked about was, you know, hell, um, does it exist or the way it exists in the way the Bible says it exists? Yeah. Um, we talked about familiar spirits and what happened, what happens when people die and things like that. So if you're interested in, um, and going back to reviewing, please go back to check those uh, episodes out. It is uh, really enlightening. Um, today, as always, I guess, uh, I don't know if it's because it's part of my name being a troublemaker, um, possibly another controversial topic, but it really doesn't have to be. And we're only discussing this because uh, we had a couple of questions, um, personal questions, I guess, from, from a couple of various people uh, about a woman's role in the church. Yeah, And, you know, obviously, you know, it's kind of like, what do you think? What should we do? And it's just like, you know, I don't, I didn't make the rules. Let's, let's turn to see what actually, you know, the person who made the rules say. And, and that's what we're going to turn to. We're going to look at the scriptures because I know, you know, there's a lot of misconceptions. There's, there's, there's a lot of perceptions and it can get emotional because everybody wants to have their stake in their role and their proclaimed position um, in working with Christ. So we never want to disrespect or or you disregard know, disregard um, anyone's position on you know what they think and what they feel. So um, with this episode, just going with the open mind um, and not so much emotional. But let's just look at the scriptures for what they say, and then you can discover the truth. You know, whatever, however God directs you to to <laughs> prayerful to yeah, abs absolutely. Yeah, and and I would just say or uh, reiterate that try not to uh, listen from an emotional standpoint, um, you know, because it just causes us to put up a a block and, yes. and you don't listen. And especially, please, um, if you're gonna watch, watch this episode all the way through. Yes, and, and don't cut it off. You know, the first thing you hear that you don't, you may not agree with. But um, again, uh. I do want to say that this was D the Troublemaker's idea. <laughs> Actually, it wasn't my idea per se. I did get this question, and I thought that it would be a good uh, topic to discuss on the podcast because I'm sure that question is floating around a lot. Oh, it's um, very much so, especially in uh, you know today's climate yeah. and different churches. And I mean, even beyond this question, there's another one that I'm not going to name right now, but um, about roles and who, yeah. who can do this and who can do that. Yes. But um, let's just say this from the start, that God has a place for everybody. You know, there's not, there's not that women don't have a place or this person doesn't have a place. Everybody, God has a place for everybody who receives him. Mm -hmm. And so, we, again, like you said, we're going to look at some things and we're probably going to look at it from um, a different perspective than what is usually mm -hmm. presented. Because okay. a lot of times it seems like what people may hear who are on, especially the side of... um you know, women not being pastors and so on and so forth is that uh, women can't, men can. 
And it's not, it's really not that cut and dry, right? Even though, you know, there is some restrictions and so on and so forth. It's not, you know, that's what people sometimes maybe hear or how it's presented. But again, we're going to take this way, 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 way back and start from the beginning where we see this principle and then we're going to bring it into, um, you know, humanity and just follow the scriptures and see what God has done from the Old Testament to the New Testament. You know how we study from Absolutely. beginning to yeah, end. Beginning, yeah. And you should, if, if it is, you should be able to be, trace it from the beginning all the way down to the end. If you can't do that, what you believe probably is not true. Again, why? Because God sees the end from the beginning. Right. God um, is God. He changes not, he says. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So if it is of God, you should be able to trace it from the Old Testament all the way to the New Testament from Genesis to Revelation. Mm -hmm. God did not change in this short time period that man's been on the scene. He changed everything that he's about because of this little moment of time that earth has been here. Right. So he has not changed for us. We're going to change for God or we're not going to be with him. Okay. All right. So let's have a word of prayer and we will touch on this sensitive topic. All right. Heavenly Father, Lord, we do come before your throne by the merits of your son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And as always, we acknowledge you as the God who sees all things from beginning to end, who has all power and all wisdom. We know that you saw this moment from the foundation of the world and you were ordained grace and a portion of the Holy Spirit for us to speak in your behalf. And not that we are worthy, Lord, so we ask that you would cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And again, give us your Holy Spirit to be our teacher and our guide. And help us, Lord, all to submit to you, to surrender our will to do your will. And to do so, Lord, not with a murmuring heart or complaining spirit, but with joy. And let us experience the peace that comes from being in harmony with Christ. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. 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 So as I said, we want to take this back uh, to the beginning because God is a God of order. And when you have order, excuse me, you also have, you know, ranks. And we know that somewhere in the annals of, you know, eternity that Satan fell from his position. Now, why did Satan fall from his position? And we did it. We talked, touched upon this several times. We did a, a two part episode on uh, Lucifer's tragedy mm-hmm. um, way in the beginning. So just just for, you know, clarity's sake, why did Satan fall from his position? Well, because there was iniquity found in him, pride, and he wanted the position that he couldn't have. <laughs> Thank you. He had a very high position. As a matter of fact, he had the highest position that it was possible for any created being to have. Right. And that was not good enough for him. Mm -hmm. He wanted to have the position of God himself. Mm -hmm. And specifically, we're talking about Christ. And so because he tried to step in a position that was not, you know, for him, this caused a rebellion, it caused a war, and it caused all the um, turmoil and and crisis that we find ourselves in today. Mm Mm-hmm. So when we're talking about roles, it's not just a a woman issue. It is a woman, man, and even angelic issue. Wow. Again, we're talking about humility versus pride. And and if you're not and and and, and another thing, who 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 is Christ really? You know what I'm saying? Who is he? Is is, is he just a man that was born of a woman? you know, a few thousand years ago, who is Christ? Christ is God. He is God. He is the creator, right? Right. Now, let's just go to Philippians real quick. We don't have a script for this. You know what I'm saying? (laughs) We are just... Sometimes we do, sometimes we don't. (laughs) Rarely we do. I don't really know when we... (laughs) Uh, Philippians chapter 2, verse 5. Because this is what it means to be a follower of Christ. You know, there's a difference between being a follower of Christ, which is a reflection of Christ. That's really what this means. You're going to, as Christ said, it's good that um, the servant be as his master and the disciple as his Lord. 
Mm. So he says, I am the way. When he's saying, I am the way, he's saying, I am the example. If you're going to be my disciple, I am your example. You do what I do. Mm. All right. So Philippians 2 gives us a good um, description of the example. Let's actually start at verse 3. Let nothing be done through what? Strife. And what is strife? Fighting. Yeah, you know I'm saying. Yes, yes. Aggressive. Aggression. Yes. Let nothing be done through strife and vainglory, but in what? Lowliness of mind. What is lowliness of mind? Humbleness. Humbleness, humility. Let each esteem one better than themselves. And then he goes on, look not every man to his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. But, what's that? But is like, even though he is equal with God, let's see how he conducted himself as our example. Mm. But made himself of what? No reputation. No reputation and took upon him the form of a what? Servant. Servant and was made in the likeness of man. And being found in fashion as a man, he did what? Humbled himself. Humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore, God also have highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. And so here is the contrast. And people don't understand what Christ is doing. He's not just doing this for mankind. He's doing this also for the angels who witnessed Lucifer, Lucifer's rebellion. Mm. To see the, two, the difference within the two characters. Here you had an angel who tried to exalt himself to the place of God. And here you have God who humbles himself to a position below the angels. Because remember it says of man that he was made a little lower than the angels. And he's showing the difference between the two characters. Mm -hmm. And this is the choice you have to make. Are you going to take the position that you can go beyond where God sets you? Or are you going to have the mind of Christ and humble yourself? Even if that means you take a position lower than what you are qualified for. Okay. All right. So when Christ walked this earth, was he a priest? When he walked the earth? When he walked the earth, was he a priest? No. No, he was not. Why? He was born of the tribe of Judah. God said the priest had to come from the Levites. Now, mm -hmm. was, was Christ qualified to be a priest? Absolutely. Absolutely. And after his resurrection, we are told that he was made a priest after the order of Melchizedek, mm -hmm. which is not by, you know, lineage, but by the appointment mm -hmm. of God. Okay. Mm -hmm. But we see that he humbled himself and was willing to take on the form of a servant. He really didn't have a title besides, you know, teacher, master, or rabbi. And, and, and this is what, you know, other people call him. It's not like he said, you need to call me rabbi. He went around all every place saying, call me by this title, call me by this title, call me by this title. The thing is, who needs a title to work for God? Mm. If you feel like you need a title to work for God, your mindset is probably in the wrong place. Wow. Because the work is being done for the glory of God. It's not being done that I should hold a title and you should, you know, respect me because I have this title above, you know, before my name. So if we're truly going to be the disciples of Christ, he made himself as a servant. And like he said, he told his disciples, you call me Lord, Lord, but I'm among you as one that serves. I'm washing your feet. I'm doing this. I'm, I'm, I'm sleeping, you know, and, and the lowest place. So it's like, if, you, if you're really going to do something and it's a work for Christ, why would you clamor for a title? Male or female? Male or female? You know what I'm saying? Why do you, do you need a title to work for Christ? Right. Absolutely not. You do not. So when we're talking about, you know, roles and, and titles, mm -hmm. that's why you said we began, let nothing be done through strife. If it causes strife, you should leave it alone if you're going to follow the example of Christ. Now, we just said that Christ earlier, and I, we didn't say this, of course, the Bible says this, that he is God. He is the creator of heaven and earth. Mm -hmm. And yet when he came to a city and they didn't want him there, he didn't exert 
his authority as God and say, you know, I created all things. I got a right to be here. He simply picked up and went somewhere else. Let nothing be done through strife and vain glory. You don't have to do this to work for Christ. He came to give us an example of being lowly. He was actually in the lineage, you know, especially through uh, Joseph in the lineage of David, heir to, heir to the throne. <laughs> so he could have exerted, you know, that right, but he did not. Because do you need a title of king to do the work of God? You do not. All right. No. And so this whole thing about God having an order and people being in a certain role is the very thing that started the entire warfare in the whole universe. Mm -hmm. So whereas people think it's a small thing, it's actually a very big thing from God's perspective, because when he sees it, what he sees is Lucifer's rebellion. Wow. That's what he say, sees. People refusing to stand in the position and the role that he gave them because they want to stand in somebody else's position and role. And that's why it becomes such a big issue. It's a character issue. It's not about ability. It's about character. Wow. And this is what God is looking for. So we just said, or, or just um, made reference to how Satan in the beginning wanted the position of Christ, and this is what caused the warfare. Mm -hmm. So let's go to where we first see Satan talking to a human being. And it just happens to be a woman. Mm. Just happens to be a woman. And let's see what he tells her. Wow. Grab your Bibles, grab your Bibles. Um, they always say, uh, follow along um, if you can. You know, but let's just, I know we've covered this in other studies, but just for the sake of those who may be watching for the first time and may not know where we're getting the idea that Satan did that, let's just turn to Isaiah 14 real quick. Okay. Really quick. You mean as far as... Uh, Lucifer. As far as what he did... In heaven. In heaven. Isaiah 14, verses 12 to 14. And it reads, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down which to the ground which did weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit upon the mount of the congregation in the size of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. And so here he's saying that I will move beyond the position that God had put me in and I will sit in the place of God himself. Yeah. And this is what basically began the entire warfare that we all find ourselves in today. And this is how deep it is. And you see his statements, I will, I will, I will. This is the mindset. Now, what was Christ's mindset? Nevertheless, not as I will, but thy will be done. I came not to do my will, but the will of him that sent me. I do only those things that please him. Do you see? This is, this is what we're actually looking at yeah. We're talking about the Bible, right? Back to the two trees, right? I, I, I hope people who watch our videos, if they come on late, will go back to the beginning and watch from the very beginning fully the videos to see the foundation that was laid. Yes. Because it helps you to understand everything from the right perspective. One of these two mindsets is going to be developed in you. Either I will or not as I will, but thy will. You know, when that speaks to uh, what God is looking for, you know, like I said, he has a role that he's established for for everyone. And when you try to step outside that role, it just speaks to your character. Yeah. He's looking at your You're character. You're going to reflect one of the two. There's no third. Yeah. There's no third character to reflect. There's no middle or neutral ground. You're either all of Christ or you're a part good, part evil. That's the other tree. See what I'm saying? You're either 100%, you're going to be 100% of God, or you're going to be some degree of good and evil, which is Satan. 
That's the choice you have. There's no middle ground. One of these two mindsets, either I will, I will, I will, or not as I will, but thy will be done. That's what's going to happen to every human being on this planet. Mm -hmm. And there is no middle ground. So let's go to Genesis chapter three. This is the first conversation recorded of the same one that we just read in Isaiah 14, talking to a human being. And, you know, re regrettably or however, however you want to say it, just happens to be a woman. Mm -hmm. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, have God said, ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as God. Oh, wasn't that the last thing he said? I will be like the Most High. Mm -hmm. See what I'm saying? So now he's promising her the same thing that he desired. He's projecting. He's projecting that you can actually be more than what God set you to be. Mm -hmm. That's what he's telling you. You don't have to be subject to God. You can actually be God. be God. Wow. And this is where it began with man. Same thing that caused the fall in heaven is the same thing that caused the fall on earth. And again, it just happened to be a woman. A woman. Now, maybe on the surface, people can't see what Eve had. Eve was the first woman created. Mm -hmm. which means she was going to be the mother of everyone on the earth that was going to come forth. Mm -hmm. By command of God, she was to receive honor as a mother from everybody that was going to be born, all the billions in the world. She would have been the number one woman of all time. Mm -hmm. Queen mother of the earth. Homage paid to her from every human being that was going to be born. Mm -hmm. That position was hers. The highest position possible for a woman to have was already given. her. Just like Lucifer, the highest position for an angel to stand in was already given him. There was nothing higher for Eve. Wow. And because she didn't appreciate the role that God gave her, she fell from the very highest position she could have had. And in the end, did she get what the devil <laughs> promised her? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. And, you know, it's, it's deep. And we're still arguing about this thing today. At the end of time, we still haven't gotten the message. Christ has come. Christ has died. The Holy Spirit's been given. And we're still not willing to be humble. That's why I say these type of questions, it's like, are we still here? Do you know the depths of wisdom and understanding that are actually in God's word? If we can just get back to the starting line. What some people think is the finish line is actually the starting line. Mm. We're still arguing about should we you know, do this or do that. God has already laid out that stuff. There's actually things to know and to experience beyond these, these surface issues. Be humble. If you're going to be a follower of Christ, you're going to be willing to do below and be in a position below what you're worthy of. He was God. He became a man and not, not, not king among men. <laughs> I'm saying servant among men. This is what you signed up for. That's why he said, if you're going to be my disciple, count the cost. If you want to exalt yourself above and above and above, Satan has an entire kingdom out there for that. And with that, in, in that same line, um, you know, when he created man, just the order of how he created that and set that order to be. Yeah. And, you know, when it goes outside of that order, you know, there's, there's chaos. Same thing, you know, from the beginning with Lucifer. When you go outside of that order and, yeah, it's just everything goes wrong. Yeah. Yeah, so 
So again, we see from the very beginning that woman, the first woman, Eve, not appreciating the position God had given her, was able to be deceived by Satan by the same temptation that caused him to fall, to fall herself. Mm. And you know what? Let's even let go to the story of Abraham. Uh, because sometimes, you know, we we may look at, you know, a woman as the person that we want to say, you know, wants to maybe step outside for whatever reason. Um, but in a case, too, when you look at like Abraham, sometimes men, we set aside the order we're supposed to have because we don't go to God. You know, yeah. Abraham's case, you know, God's like, you know, you're going to have a son. He takes it to Sarah. Sarah comes up with this plan. Instead of Abraham saying no or say, let's go back to God, he goes along with the plan. But it's like, listen, God didn't tell Sarah to plan. <laughs> yeah. God gave you the plan. <laughs> yeah. So everything. He, you no, know, actually, he didn't give him the plan. He Well, he he, he, he gave him the the order, basically. He, well, what was going to happen. He didn't tell him how. He, he didn't tell him how. <laughs> exactly. So instead of. Abraham just going back to God and trusting in God, he left it up to Sarah to kind of help guide that order instead of him following suit. And when you do that and you go outside of the order, things get kind of crazy. Yeah. Absolutely crazy. Yeah. So let's go to um, one of the scriptures that's often used when we talk about women um, as pastors, women as, women as elders, women as teaching in the church. Mm -hmm. And it's found in uh, First Timothy, First Timothy. And, you know, ironically, like I said, we don't have a script. You know, this scripture just actually uh, came to my mind. And it actually refers back to Genesis 3. Mm. <laughs> it actually refers back to Genesis 3. All right. First so, Timothy. First Timothy chapter 2. Okay. We're gonna actually going to start in verse 9. Because there, there's another uh, layer to this <laughs> that we're definitely not going to touch on in here because we're going to run out of time probably very quickly. This was supposed to be one episode. It could turn into two. Uh oh But, um, you know, and it's about dress and, and jewelry and all this stuff. But let's look at verse 9. And we'll take it down to 15, starting at verse 9. It says, In like manner also, the women adorn themselves in modest apparel with shamefacedness and sobriety not with broided hair or gold or pearls or costly array but which becometh women professing godliness with good works let the woman learn in silence with all subjection but I suffer not a woman to teach nor usurp authority over a man but to be in silence for Adam was first formed then Eve and Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. Mm. Notwithstanding, she shall be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith and charity and holiness with sobriety. And it was a lot, a lot to unpack here. Wow. And again, I just read the scripture. Some people blow up on you. Well, what are you saying? I didn't say nothing. Paul said everything I just read. But Paul is laying down some principles. He's laying down some principles. So what does he say? Um... First, let women adorn themselves in modest apparel. That's supposed to be, and really that's men and women. There's supposed to be a, a level of modesty about you. There's going to be a difference. If you have a different mindset, everything that you do is going to be different. Mm -hmm. Because before you do something, it starts off as a thought in your mind. Mm -hmm. So the mind of Christ is not going to choose to dress the same way as somebody with the mind of Satan. It just, it doesn't happen. You know what I'm saying? There's two different mindsets. If Christ is in control of your mind, that means everything you do is going to reflect that he is in control. If Satan has influence over your mind, I see, notice I didn't say control. When I said with Christ, I said control. Because you, if you're with Christ 100%, you have yielded the will. He's not going to take control. You have to yield it. Mm -hmm. Now, Satan, if you get to a certain place, he'll take it. But he'll settle for influence until he gets you to the point that he can take it. So when I'm talking about being a Christian, I'm talking about one who has yielded themselves to the Holy Spirit and so that God can take control. Okay. He does not, you know, again, keep control against your will. Mm -hmm. At any moment you choose, you can take control back. Okay. But if Satan has influence, I didn't say control, influence over your mind, 
then that's going to be reflected in the things that you do. Okay. All right. And so this is what Paul is talking about when he's talking about adorning themselves in modest apparel. And, you know, you can also see this when the Israelites were coming out of Egypt and the things Moses was, was given to write. He told them about what to eat, what to wear, how to go to the bathroom, <laughs> where to put the stuff, everything. So if God is in control, if you're like, Lord, please speak to me. He starts speaking to you and he tell you this, this, this. And if I got to do all that. And it's like, really, you you don't want to give God control because if he has control, you're not going to be able to do the things that you want to do. Right. So if you want to see what it's like to have God in control, go back and look at those things you skip over that Moses wrote. Because he sh- you're going to see that if I'm in control, I have something to say about every area of your life. Yeah. All right. And so he talks about, you know, the apparel and the jewelry. And the, again, though it says women, this applies to men and women. Yeah. Okay. And then it says in verse 11, let the woman learn in subjection in silence with all subjection. But I suffer not a woman to teach nor to usurp authority over a man, but to be in silence. So does this mean nowhere at all can a woman teach? No, that's not what Paul is saying. He's talking about, you know, in the order of the church, God has set men as the leaders. That's his order. The same way he set the angels in order and Christ is above the angels and so on and so forth. This is the order. (laughs) Plain and simple. In my house, this is the order. All right. And then he says, why? For Adam, what? Verse 13. Was first form. Then Eve. What is he talking about? He's creating the order, right? Yeah. Adam was first. He created man first and then the woman. Then the woman. But what does that mean? What is we talking about first? What does that mean? Is it just with men and women? Think about the family. Oh, children, right? Think about, if, if think about Jacob and his children. Yeah. The firstborn, you know, see all throughout the scripture, the firstborn, the firstborn, the firstborn. Mm-hmm. The firstborn has the birthright, the birthright and leadership role. Okay. So even if it's, you know, he gets other brothers, all the brothers aren't considered first. Mm. The firstborn has the leadership position by birthright. That's what it means, birthright. Okay. The firstborn has the birthright. Okay. So this is not just a principle about women. But because Adam, the man, was born first and then the woman, not born first, but created first, then the woman was created. This is the God is setting the order in his house and the household itself. And remember, the church is just a greater reflection of the household that God set up in the beginning. Right. And so man was given the leadership rope. And and we're going to transition off of that in a minute to see that this is not just talking about women, but in his house, men were given the leadership role. And then in verse 14, he gives another secondary reason. And Adam was not deceived, right? Right. But the woman being deceived was in the transgression. So because the woman is the one who um, was used to bring in sin to humanity, there's a secondary reason of why the man has to be in that position as leader because the woman is the one who was at fault in falling for the devil's, you know, uh, wow, deception. Notwithstanding, she shall be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith and charity and holiness with sobriety. And, you know, it's really a sad thing that both men and women, that we don't open ourselves up more to the spirit of God to appreciate what God has done. Because, you know, the world has presented that, you know, women can do more than just have babies and raise children. As if working in an office is more prestigious or or, or, or a greater import than bringing a life into the world. There is no higher work on this earth than birthing a child. And nurturing that child to, you know, adulthood so that they can live forever as a subject 
of the king of heaven. And it's such interesting that uh, such that major role only a woman can do. They can, that's what I'm trying <laughs> to tell you. Nobody else can do it. A man can't do it. That's what I'm trying to tell you. God set the role. Mm. And it's like the role that he gave a woman is of the highest importance because you're not raising children for a husband. You're raising children for God. Mm. At, at some point in, in your Christian experience, you're supposed to understand that that child who came through you is actually not yours. Mm. And they're going to go off one day. And it was your it was your responsibility as the nurturer to make sure that child was nurtured in the fear and admonition of the Lord so that the Lord would have a servant in the earth and have a soul that would live forever. That was the work that was given to women. And like you said, a man can do it. And it has been downplayed so much that now Satan has convinced women to fight for the right to kill the baby in the womb. Mm. The safest place on earth for a child is supposed to be in their mother's womb. Mm. That should be the very safest place on the earth for a child. And Satan has such influence over the mind at this time that women fight for the right to kill the baby inside of the womb. Mm. Do you see how far from grace we have fallen? How far from the purpose of God we have fallen? And so the role of woman was high and holy. And you see how the Old Testament starts with Eve bringing forth the fruit of sin and death into the world, right? Hold up. Hold up. This is this story's not over. The New Testament starts with Mary bringing mm. forth the fruit of Christ and eternal life we to the world. The effect. Verse 15. Look at 15 again. Look at 15 again. Notwithstanding, she shall be saved in childbearing. Because a woman was going to be the one who brought the Savior into the world to undo what the first woman did. Wow. See what I'm saying? We're so busy arguing about titles and roles that you're missing what the scriptures are actually saying. Mankind could not have been saved without a woman yielding her body to bring the Savior into the world. What if Mary had been fighting for the right to get an abortion? Yeah. And that's just another thought. So again, the Old Testament starts with a woman bringing in the fruit of sin to the world. The New Testament starts with a woman bringing in the fruit of righteousness and eternal life into the world. She shall be saved or redeemed in childbearing for the Lord. And what did Mary say when the angel came to her? Behold, the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to your, my, your word. I will stand in my place in this role to um, bring this child into the world and nurture this child for the Lord. And you think it's just a one-time thing. No, Christ is an example. So he's an example of what women are supposed to do for God. You're supposed to bring children into the world, not just for your husband, not just for your personal enjoyment. This is a work that you're doing for God to populate heaven. All right. So it's deep, yo. Right. Yeah. Like I said, it's, it's presented sometimes in a, in a very long, wrong uh, spirit. But again, it says that Adam was formed first form, then Eve, mm -hmm. And he's talking about the right of the firstborn. Mm -hmm. So as I said in the beginning, sometimes this thing is presented as women can't and men can. Can all men teach in the church or have a leadership positions in the church? No, no. No, it no. really there's there's actually a bunch of qualifiers, I believe, right? Oh yeah, yeah. There's <laughs> a bunch of qualifiers. Yeah. Now let's let's just go to a very simple scripture, a scripture that I'm sure people have read a thousand times because it's repeated all throughout Exodus. But this one little phrase opened my eyes to again God's order. Let's look at Exodus 629. 
It says, the Lord spake unto who? Moses. Moses. Exodus 14, 15. Don't even turn there. The Lord said unto Moses. Exodus 9, 19. And the Lord said unto Moses. Exodus 20. No, Exodus 33, verse 11. And the Lord spake unto Moses. You know how many times this is said throughout the Exodus journey and, you know, the book of Leviticus and Mm -hmm. Numbers and Deuteronomy? Why is that? Because he was dealing directly with Moses. He had some... Because Moses was what? To choose him. The leader. Mm. Moses was the leader. Now, was Moses just leading a bunch of women? No. He was leading men. Did the men have the authority as men not to listen to Moses? I mean... The authority. I didn't say the choice. I said the authority. <laughs> By God's authority, no. No, no. So they had to be what? Obedient and... Give me another word. What's the word? Submissive. Submissive. Subject. Do you see why this is not just women? Mm. See, we're talking about submissive and, and it, where everybody wants to get emotional. But men were called to the same thing. When God set up man as leader over his people, the men had to be in subjection. They had to be submissive. Yeah, and even take it a step further to, you know, the, the priests. Everybody couldn't be a priest. Certain people oh. were, and, that, oh. and that's what it is. It's like and certain people could go into into the tabernacle, and guess what happens to the ones who said they was going anyway? <laughs> yeah, we don't look at that. <laughs> we can't read all of this, so I'll have to give the backdrop of the story. Okay. Um, When they were coming out of Egypt. Just for reference, what's the scripture reference so people can know? Most of it, I think, is found in the book of Numbers, Numbers. chapter 16. Okay. It may be a couple of, extend beyond that chapter, but most of it is found in number 16. Oh, boy. Um, but at that time, when God brought them forth out of Egypt, and he had set up the tabernacle, and then he set the priesthood, and he set Aaron as the high priest mm-hmm. and Aaron's sons to be the priest, and so on and so forth. And there rose up some who thought that they should be priests as well. <laughs> you see? And they gathered a whole big congregation of people along with them. Now, again, to us, it seems like a small thing. Mm-hmm. You know what God has seen? Rebellion. Satan. Mm. Satan. Remember, Satan wanted to sit in the position of Christ. And he his tail, according to Revelation 12, drew a third part of the angels. So when he came, he didn't come alone. He had went through, mm-hmm. you know, and convinced a whole bunch of people that, you know, this should be. Mm-hmm. They did the same thing. Mm-hmm. They wanted the position. They had leadership positions too. They just didn't have the priesthood. But they wanted that position. And so they gathered together and they were going to come and make Moses, you know what I'm saying, uh, make them priests. Mm-hmm. And so let's read just a little bit of it. Right, number 16. Number 16, we'll start at verse Eight, And Moses said unto Korah, Here I pray you, ye sons of Levi, seemeth it but a small thing unto you that God, the God of Israel, have separated you from the congregation of Israel to bring you near to himself to do the service of the tabernacle of the Lord and to stand before the congregation to minister unto them and hath brought thee near to him and all thy brethren, the sons of Levi, with thee and seek ye the priesthood also. Hmm. So they were Levites. They had a position to actually work in the tabernacle. It just was not the actual priesthood. It wasn't the top position. So they wanted the top position. It's not that God didn't give them a work to do. God did give them work to do. But they weren't satisfied with that place that God put them in. They wanted to stand at the very head and leadership. Mm. See why I said this is not just about women? Because even though God never called a woman to stand at the head of a church or at the head of a household, he gave them a rope. Mm -hmm. But he didn't call every man to do that either. Right. And so everybody has to be in in subjection and submissiveness to what God has ordered. All right. And so, you know, if you know the story first, um, God being merciful, he said, we're going to take all of the staffs of everybody 
who, you know, is clamoring to be the high priest. Mm-hmm. And we're going to take Aaron's rod as well. And we're going to put them into the tabernacle in the most holy place. And God himself will show who he has chosen. And this is being done mercifully. So when you see this, maybe you'll repent quickly, quickly. So they put all the rods inside of the most holy place. The next day, Moses brings all the rods out. Everybody's rod looks the same except Aaron's. And it has flowers on it and it has almonds on it. So this dead stick has grown, you know, flowers and fruit over the night. And so God is trying to show, see, it's not that Aaron and, and, and I conspired to make him the high priest. God has shown you by supernatural sign that Aaron was chosen by God. Mm. But they don't accept that. They get upset and they get into their feelings. And what ends up happening is the earth opens up and swallows them up. And this is where, you know, you find that first ever happening anywhere. You know, the earth oh. opens up and swallows so we're not. So when we talk about, you know, women's role, we're talking about everybody. This is not just a problem for women. This is a problem for men. This is a problem for angels. Everybody needs to stay in their place. Right. God has a certain order and everybody needs to be submitted and in subjection to that order. You know what? Go ahead. Now, I was just going to say, and it, it just always turns out to be a sense of, you know, pridefulness when you don't uh, acknowledge the significance of the role that he set forth. And you basically set that responsibility aside, trying to do something that you weren't called or necessarily qualified to do. You might be qualified. It's not about qualifications. It's about call. Mm. It's about calling. (laughs) Yeah, because they say, what do they say? God doesn't necessarily uh, call a qualified. He qualifies to call. Yeah. You know, so, because nobody's qualified, to be honest. Mm. Who is qualified to work for a holy God? What sinner is qualified to work for a holy God? Mm. The very thought is is pride. That a, a fallen human being can think that they are qualified to work a service for God. Wow. What service can be acceptable except his grace come in and work in you and through you? Wow. So you're looking at, you know who is the most qualified of the apostles? Take a wild guess. Cool. Judas. Uh- I was going to say that, but I was like, it just Judas. He was the one who had that business mind and so on and so forth. That's why he had the bag. Judas was actually amongst qualifications. He was very qualified as a leader, but his heart isn't. Mm. See, everybody's looking at, well, I can do this and I can teach and, and I know how to do books and I know how to do this. Are you, do you have the spirit of God? Because the work of God is about the spirit of God. It's not a human work. You don't have the willingness to submit to God. You're already disqualified. Mm. People are claiming that, you know, because they went to theology school and got a master's degree, that they're qualified to be a preacher. But what is a master's degree if you don't have a degree from the master? See what I'm saying? It's like, so you, you go into school and that qualifies you? You know who nailed Christ to the cross? The theological school. The theological school. <laughs> wow. So it's like, what, what? how do you claim that you're qualified? And if God has qualified you, I guarantee you, you will not be looking for a recognition of, of a title. You would just do the work that God told you to do. So let's look at some of the, uh, you know, instances where, you know, the roles I mean, it's not even necessarily the roles. It's, I mean, you said something before, it's the roles in the work, you know, because you mentioned, yeah. you know, you have Ruth, you have, you know, like the woman at yeah. the well. Um, you know, there's there's room to, to yeah. play your position. Man. When it comes to scope of work, a man will never be as effective as a woman, mm-hmm. especially nowadays. Mm-hmm. You know, they just, women have a subduing uh, nature about them. Let's just say we're going door to door in today's world Mm -hmm. and me and you are going door to door, knocking on doors and two beautiful women are going door to door, knocking on doors. Yeah. Who's going to be more effective? Yeah. Thank you. 
So they just have a subduing nature about them. You see two guys come, you're like, what's what's about to happen? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You see women come and you, you're more relaxed. Right. You know what I'm saying? More open. You don't have your guards up and so on. They have a an ability about them to do a work that men and to get into places and to, you know, talk to people and, and uh, and gay world might not be a good thing because those women that had you tied up and running. I mean, with yeah, you, Satan, with can, your <laughs> Satan can use, you know, those same qualities, but the qualities are the same. Right. How they're used is different. You think Satan doesn't see those qualities? Mm. Why do you think they use women to sell everything by undressing them in front of the thing that they want you to um, buy? Yeah. So Satan sees the the um the power and the um just the attraction that God has given them. So it's going to be used for one or the other. It's going to be used. You know what I'm saying? It's not like it's not going to be used. It's going to be used either by God or by Satan. Mm. But we let's touch upon a couple more things and then we're going to bring it to a close. Mm -hmm. and, and just again, to show again from Old Testament to New Testament, God's order. Now we see with the priesthood that God set up the sons of Aaron. The who? The sons of Aaron. Okay. Yeah. All right. Not the daughters of Aaron. Right. If you were a daughter, you could marry amongst the priesthood, mm -hmm. but you couldn't be a priest just because you were a woman born from Aaron. Right. There was never a woman priest in the Old Testament. Right. Now, when Christ set up the leadership of the church in the New Testament, he chose 12. 12 men. This is the time that if he's going to set women in leadership role in this church, he's supposed to do it. Just like we talked about um, yesterday with the death of the testator and his will and so on and so forth. If he's going to change something, it has to be before he dies. Mm -hmm. When he chose, he chose 12. Even though women were more loyal to him. <laughs> right. I can take you all throughout the New Testament. Those who were the most loyal to him those who showed the deepest faith to him were the woman, women. And that is on record. Mm. Why do you think that's in the Bible? Right. God is trying to show the women, I see you. I see you. Your reward is coming. You know what I'm saying? Just because you don't have this role doesn't mean you can't do that work. Now, you talked about mm. uh, the woman at the well. Let's go to John chapter 4 real quick. That's deep this, right there. this is the scope of the work that a woman does. And if she can do like Christ and have this mind that's in Christ Jesus and humble yourself as a servant, as Christ did, not taking on, you know, the position of the priest, not taking on the position of a Pharisee and the uh, synagogue and so on and so forth. He avoided all of that. He was a carpenter. Is not this the carpenter's son? That's what people were calling him, the carpenter's son. Because I don't need a title if God has called me. I can just do the work I do humbly and, and I can get all the recognition and accolades I need from the Father directly. And that's that's all Christ was looking for. For 30 years, the God of heaven lived first subject to his parents and then working in a carpenter shop. Mm. 30 years. At the end of 30 years, living a quiet life, he gets baptized and the heavens open up and the father says, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Who is qualified to be much more than a carpenter. But he humbled himself to be a carpenter for 30 years, quietly living and just growing his relationship with me so that I could do for him what I'm going to do for him in these next three and a half years. And even though he's still healthy and qualified to live on, He's going to close his life down after three and a half years of ministry and the prime of his life. So did John the Baptist. Mm. John the Baptist was only six months older than Jesus, and he died before Jesus. Prime of his life, faithful. These are my servants in whom I am well pleased because they simply obey my will. And men and women need to adopt that mindset if they're going to do a real service for Christ. All right. Wow. So, wow. So old Testament, he sets up priesthood all the way through men. When he comes personally and sets up the leadership for the new Testament, 
He chooses 12 men. That's it. Wow. All right. So God has spoken. But do women have a work? Oh, yeah. Yes. So you said John? John chapter 4. Now, here's a woman. Talk about not qualified. <laughs> I'm saying. Talk about not qualified. As, as Christ is talking to her, you know, and they're having this conversation. He's she's like, you know, give me this. Give me of this water this, that I come and not have to draw again. And he said, go call your husband. And she's like, I don't have a husband. <laughs> and he, you know, he, he, he wants to draw out some things. And he mm-hmm. says, you've answered well that you don't have a husband because you've had five husbands or four, whatever you say, four or five husbands. And the one you have now is not your husband. So this is a very gentleman-like way of saying, yeah, I know you don't have a husband, but you had men who have had you in a way that they should not have had you unless you were their wife. Mm. And you're with somebody right now the same way who is not your husband. You said well that you don't have a husband. So he's trying to get her basically in her heart to repent. You know what I'm saying? Mm. In a very, very subtle and gentleman-like way, he's trying to get her to repent. And then, you know what she does? She acknowledges what he said was true. She says, I want to be, want to read it? Yeah, let's read it. All right. We'll start at verse 15. It says, the woman said unto him, sir, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. Jesus said unto her, go, call thy husband and come hither. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said unto her, Thou hast well said, I have no husband, for thou hast had five husbands, and he whom thou now hast is not thy husband, and that saidest thou truly. The woman said unto him, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. What is she saying? That you know things that... What you just said is true. Yeah. (laughs) You're right. I, I confess. Yeah. He just brought forth confession from her. He wants to bless her. You see, he wants the water. It is not literal water. What is the water? The water is the Holy Spirit. Out of their belly shall flow rivers of living water. This he spake of those that will receive the Holy Spirit. John 7, 35, I think that is. And so the water that he was going to give her was the Holy Spirit, but he couldn't give it to her unless she confessed her sins. So he did it in a way so not to offend her or make her very, very embarrassed. So he said, go call your husband. And so she said, I don't have a husband. And he was like, yeah. And he ran down Mm -hmm. her life of fornication in a very respectful and sympathetic way. And then she says, I perceive you're a prophet. What she's saying is what you just said was true. I confess. Mm. You can't. Jesus is incredible. Yeah. And and he's what I really want to talk about and study. Jesus is incredible. The way he engages people. The way he convicts of sin is so, just so compassionate Mm -hmm. that people melt, you know, for him. Mm -hmm. And here, so he says, goes on, go down to verse 25. Because after that confession, the Holy Spirit is basically leading her thoughts. Mm. The woman saith unto him, I know that Messiah is coming which is called Christ. When he is come, he will tell us all things. You think she just had that thought of herself? She just talking to a stranger, <laughs> dusty on, on a well, and all of a sudden she starts talking about the Messiah. Remember, she wanted the water. Mm. He said something to bring forth a confession. She said, I confess, that's right. Now she's ready. Holy Spirit comes in and brings a thought about the Messiah to her mind. Watch yeah. The woman say, verse 25, the woman saith unto him, I know it that Messiah is cometh, Messiah cometh, which is called Christ. When he is come, he will tell us all things. Jesus saith unto her, I that speak unto thee am he. See what I'm saying? Once he got the recognition from the Holy Spirit through her comment, she's ready to know who I am. Mm. If you look beneath the surface, you can see the spiritual things that are going on. All right. So he's waiting for the confirmation that she has received that spirit. And when that thought came into her mind, he understood. And he says, now she's ready to know 
that I am the Messiah. Yes, I am he. Now, verse 28. The woman then left her water pot and went her way into the city and saith unto the men, Come, see a man which told me all things that ever I had did. Is not this the Christ? Then went out what? Wow. The city and came unto him. This is the work that a woman can do. Now he's got 12 apostles, leaders in the church, and not one of them brought him a whole city. The 12 of them together didn't bring him a whole city. So in a sense, she is ministering to... She me. is proclaiming yeah. Christ for the very first time in Samaria. The first person to proclaim Christ in Samaria was a woman who was in fornication, mm. who received grace and repentance and the Holy Spirit. And with one conversation, she didn't see any miracle. She didn't say, come out and see a person who can heal all the sick people. Mm. Now, now understand, the apostles were going out with miracle working power and with the record that Christ could do anything. All she went out with is one experience and one conversation, and she brought back the whole city. The first person to proclaim Christ to in Samaria, his disciples weren't even allowed there yet. The first one to actually proclaim Christ to Samaria was this woman who was a fornicator just a few minutes earlier, but who received grace and repentance and the Holy Spirit and brought the Savior back a whole city. Now, let's go down. Verse 39. And many of the Samaritans of that city believed on him for the saying of the woman, which testified, he told me all that ever I did. So when the Samaritans were come unto him, they besought him that he would tarry with them, and he abode there three days. And any more believed because of his own word, and said unto the woman, they went back to her. Now we believe. Not because of thy saying, for we have heard him ourselves and know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. Wow. Now, you want to tell me about a work with no title? Does she need a title? And she is now immortalized in Scripture. This happened centuries ago, more than a thousand years ago. And she has a place in the record of God for the work that she did with no title. Wow. So I think we are. I mean, that's powerful enough. That's enough to blow things yeah. out of the water right yeah, now. Yeah. Let me just say this one more. Yeah. Because the ones who were first at the tomb were not his disciples. Right. They were the women. So the first people's person or the first people to proclaim that Christ rose from the dead were women. The first ones, to, this is deep because the resurrection is, if Christ didn't rise from the grave, there's really no gospel. You know, so though he died, Paul says, if he didn't, if Christ rose not, you are still in your sins and your faith is in vain. If Christ didn't rise, the, there is no gospel. The first ones to proclaim that Christ rose from the dead were the women. Again, I'm telling you, and when you look at the stories of the New Testament, the ones that gave him the deepest devotion, the deepest affection were the women. And as a reward, he let them be first and doing some things. Mm -hmm. Even though because of the order of God, the men were set in leadership. Mm -hmm. But still, he allowed them to be first in some things. So the first ones to actually proclaim that he rose from the dead to proclaim the resurrection of Christ after the angel <laughs> saying mm -hmm. was the women. Mm -hmm. So don't don't talk about roles and titles when God is not impressed by that. That's something that Satan leads into. And the woman at the well, well at the woman at the well didn't go to school, didn't have nothing, nope. or none of that. But she would only sit. That's amazing. And didn't see any miracles. Didn't perform any miracles. Because that's not what's necessary to win people to Christ. Wow. And, and it's funny, it's like he didn't even, nope, not even a miracle on her. It's just the fact that, it's, that he brought out her sins. It's like, this is what I He done. gave her the water. Wow. She actually received the Holy Spirit. That's what people are missing. The Holy Spirit doesn't need miracles to change hearts. 
Miracles don't change hearts. It's a miracle if your heart gets changed, you know what I'm saying? But it doesn't take, you know, miracles like you see something amazing mm -hmm. to change hearts. Because the miracle in itself was, yeah, she 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 changed. She, she that changed. was the miracle. That, that's what I said in, <laughs> in that moment. Wow. Before she went to the well, she was a fornicator. One conversation with Christ, she was proclaiming the 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 the, the Messiah's the gospel. You know what I'm saying? One conversation with Christ, conversion. This is the gospel. You know what I'm saying? The gospel is the power of God into salvation. People teach it like it's a, a self-help thing. It's, no, it's not. We're talking about omnipotent power that can change you in a moment. The same way God in the beginning speaks, and it is. If the heart is really open to Christ, one conversation with Christ, one word from Christ will transform you and set you on a whole new course. Wow. So on that note, this was phenomenal. This was this was phenomenal. So hopefully people are listening uh, that had that question has some new insight on 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 the topic. Um, you know, the one thing that I'm taking away from this study, and it's not just from a woman's perspective, it's a yeah. don't get caught I hope, up. I hope men yeah, can take it, it too. Cause yeah, yeah. You it's know, both sides. Don't get caught up on roles and titles that are in the eyes of man and mixing it up and getting it confused with that's what God's work because God don't need titles no. at all. If he does not have God, a title amongst, you know, yeah. the titles that were there in Israel. He yeah. was called a prophet. You couldn't help but call him that. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Yeah. So just 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 remember there's a difference between having a role and doing the work. Yeah. So that's that's or having a title having doing a title and because she she still has a role. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Have a role the title. The, yeah. yeah. The title. The title. Um Yeah, that's deep. So yeah, that that was heavy. That was heavy. El El Sykes actually uh that was really heavy. Um, thank you for this study and thank you for joining us. And hopefully, um, you know, if you have any comments, drop them in the comments, you know, please feel free to sure we will. share. I know, <laughs> I know. And, 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 but you know what? It is what it is. The Bible said what, what it said and God said what he said. And that's the final word. Yeah. So um, thank you for joining and thank you for listening and be sure to join in next Sunday. And we look forward to seeing you. Thank you. Um, thank you for sharing and liking. Please continue to do so. And we'll see you next week. God bless. Amen.